please you can join us this afternoon for a very exciting uh, lecture on a follow-up from the absolute zero reports um, and webinar that we gave last year so i'm sam turner i'm the co-chair of the imeki manufacturing industries division um, i'm also with a day job hat on i'm the cto of the high value manufacturing catapults i also chair the uk fires living lab industry group i'm really pleased to welcome uh, Julian Allwood, who is the director of the UK Fires um, team, the group that published the Absolute Zero report in late 2019. And around 12 months ago, we gave you a, a webinar, or Julian took you through the Absolute Zero recommendations, which were truly prescient, I think, in terms of the changes we've seen over the last 12 months, the government's 10 point plan, also the industrial decarbonisation policy, and the commitment from government to hit a 45% reduction in emissions by 2030 as a waypoint. The Absolute Zero report was a reality check on the maturity really of energy systems and technologies required to deliver net absolute zero by 2050. And thinking about the behavioral changes and choices we will have to make as a community to, to achieve those targets. Today, Julian is gonna talk us through a very pragmatic guide on how we deliver the UK manufacturing growth whilst working towards the 45% reduction for 2030 and the 2050 net zero targets. Julian, welcome and um, over to you. Uh, one thing I'd like to say, sorry Julian, before you start, is that throughout the session you can please post questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be looking at those throughout the session and I'll be fielding questions at the end. So Julian is going to give around a 40 minute presentation there'll be 20 minutes of Q&A as we go through. So please do feel free to post your questions and we're fielding those to Julian at the end of the presentation. Julian. Thanks very much indeed, Sam. Um, I hope you can see the screen now. So the uh, background to this presentation is that when we released the Absolute Zero report, uh, Sam presented this to the uh, senior team across all the catapults in the UK and they very sensibly said, that's interesting. So what opportunities does that give us for growth in the UK? And that's been the focus of our work over the last year to start thinking about that. We've run, uh, we're running uh, five sectoral streams in thinking about growth opportunities. Uh, so in the energy system, in construction, in transport, in food and drink, and on materials and manufacturing. So what I want to do today is to give you an update on where we've got to in thinking about growth in materials and manufacturing compatible with absolute zero. Obviously, I want to start that by motivating it and reminding you of why absolute zero uh, is so important. And it's all about the false hope being played on in innovation in the energy infrastructure as the magic bullet to solve climate change. Over the last 30 years, we have been talking about climate change and boy, have we been talking. We fly around the world with great enthusiasm to have big meetings about climate change. You can see I've listed some of them here and you can see that global emissions have been steadily rising as a result. So far, talking about climate change has had no effect on global emissions. The most recent converts to uh, thinking about climate change are the Americans uh, following Biden's leadership. And these are comments that um, John Kerry made three weeks ago at the Washington summit. And you can see that his entire rhetoric is about optimism. That's happened with every country in the world who's got it with climate change. Their leader has announced that we're going to solve it with innovation, particularly in the energy infrastructure sector. sector. Conventional mechanisms of funding, R&D, entrepreneurship will work. The country will get richer by selling this magic solution to other countries uh, and all will be well. The public won't notice and will solve the problem. It's interesting to go back a few years and to look at what Al Gore said in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech in 2007. And you can see that the rhetoric is unchanged. It's all about entrepreneurs and invention. Don't worry about climate change. We'll invent our way out of it. So let's do a little bit of a reality check on that. I've had one of my PhD students working over the last couple of years on the fastest ever rates of change in the energy infrastructure sector. What this graph shows is the proportion of a country's electricity supply 
supplied by new technology, nuclear, wind, or combined cycle gas, in the countries that deployed it fastest. And you can see that there's two phases to the development of a new technology. There's a preparation stage up till the point that the technology reaches about 5% of its eventual penetration. And then there's a deployment phase. Preparation takes between 30 to 100 years and has never taken less than 30 years to get to that 5%. And that's because of the whole series of developments that have to occur. It's not just invention, as the, uh, the political rhetoric would have us believe. Climate change, solving climate change isn't an Apollo program because we're not trying to do something once. We go from the first to pilot scales at increasing scale, pilot studies, connections to the existing infrastructure, dealing with legal environmental permissions, social consent after the first accident. There always is a first accident, and so that's the point at which a public discussion takes place. We have to think about financing needs to bring a technology about and so on. And all of that adds up to a 30 to 100 year um, preparation stage. And then deployment begins. But unlike the rhetoric of the innovation enthusiasts, it isn't exponential. This isn't like selling an iPhone or a uh, software system, because these are projects that have political risk and occur in the background of the incumbent industry fighting it, trying to prevent it happening. And you can see here that no country in the world has ever deployed a new energy technology faster than 2% of its total electricity supply per year. That's the world record with the CCGT implementation in the UK. The bottom half of the graph shows that for behavior change, both phases can be faster, both the planning period and the deployment period can be faster. And we know that from the last year that in extremists, we can make behavior change very rapidly indeed, as we have in lockdown. So the consequence of that is we actually want to mitigate climate change, is that we ought to be recognizing two different stages of energy technology development. All the things that are innovative, we want to find out about. Hydrogen, CCS, that's carbon capture and storage, negative emissions technologies, electric planes, all of these new ideas, we definitely want to pursue for all we're worth in order to gain experience of them. But they're all over here on the left-hand side of the graph. They're a long way from the stage at which we can begin to deploy them. At the moment, carbon capture and storage has a global capacity equal to 0.1% of the world's emissions. But three quarters of that capacity is used for increasing fossil fuel production through enhanced oil recovery. So carbon capture for environmental benefit is at 0.025% uh, of the world's emissions. So it's very, very early in this stage of development. It shouldn't be anywhere near policy. When we talk about deployment, we want things that we know we can scale. And that means wind, solar, and nuclear power on the supply side, and then heat pumps, building insulation, electric cars, and so on on the demand side. So that's the critical background to this uh, talk is to separate out things that we want to develop to gain experience and things that we can actually deploy. Let's just pick apart a few of them. Um, one of the uh, false hopes is making steel from hydrogen. The only pilot study being developed in the world is in Norway, the hybrid uh, process. And they're very transparent about their information. And here's their analysis of the electricity requirements of making steel from iron ore using hydrogen. And you can see that the key result is that it takes seven times more electricity to make uh, steel from iron ore with hydrogen than it does to make steel by recycling. Uh, so that would be great if we had an excess supply of fossil free uh, electricity, but we don't. We're short of non-emitting electricity at the moment. The same is true for all other uses of hydrogen, incidentally. It always takes far more electricity to make things uh, with hydrogen than it does if we use the direct electrical equivalent. What about um, the hopes of making cement with carbon capture and storage? I've talked about the global figures. Here on the right is a graph of the um, enthusiasm for the oil and gas funded lobby for carbon capture and storage. And you can see that most of the projects that have been reported in early development have already been cancelled. Um, even the things which are apparently in advanced development have mainly been cancelled. 
Uh, what's actually operational is mainly uh, increasing fossil fuel expansion. Only one pilot plant in the world is planned uh, for carbon capture and storage applied to cement. It's a small scale, and we're waiting for the Norwegian parliament to make a decision about whether it's going to go ahead. Um, and it's, of course, unlikely that it will happen at the time scale developed. So it's great that we're doing it. It's important. It's something we want to gain experience of but it should be nowhere near policy for developing climate mitigation because what we want to enact in policy is things that we can actually do now. The UK is keen on reporting, the UK government is keen on reporting our success, some of which is genuine. We have reduced our emissions by converting from coal to gas powered electricity, by capturing methane from landfills um, and uh, by using some wind power to avoid building extra gas uh, powered stations. However, some of our uh, claimed improvements are illusory. Uh, shutting factories in the UK and opening them elsewhere, uh, our balance of trade has got massively worse since we signed the Climate Change Act. That has made no difference to global emissions at all. Not counting international aviation doesn't have any effect on emissions. Our underlying emissions related to transport, buildings, farming and the residual industry are essentially unchanged. And you'll get a sense of the scale of what we're committed to. If I put the targets, the Theresa May's change to the Climate Change Act is zero emissions by 2050. And the current government have made two further announcements, a 45% cut, as Sam has just said, from today uh, to 2030, and then a really stringent cut, including international aviation and shipping by 2035. You can see that those cuts are exactly in line with what we want to do, what the science tells us to do. But the underlying emissions have so far shown no cut. So there's a gap here, and the gap is about this false hope based on innovation in the energy infrastructure. We've explored that in the um, manufacturing sector in the UK, within UK fires. We've done a survey of 20 UK manufacturers' sustainability reports just to get an idea of how they're responding to this. And it's pretty alarming that uh, most of them have no plans to reduce their emissions. And even if they do, it's to reduce rather than to reach zero. Um, only, uh, what is that, just over two thirds have a plan to reduce their fuel combustion emissions. And almost none of them have a plan to reduce their process emissions. So to summarize that, where we are, if I take a view of risk, then you could map all the approaches to mitigating climate change on a chart of technological risk against behavioral or societal risk. We're currently planning all of our mitigation hopes based on these techno-optimistic views of the energy infrastructure, whether it's carbon capture and storage, negative emissions or hydrogen. Um, with the extreme opposite is virtuous asceticism, so people choosing behaviors that's going to grow because the number of people getting concerned about climate change is still growing. But we're missing the obvious. We're missing the fact that we could have smaller cars. We could take the train rather than flying or using the car, keep things longer, wash wisely and so on. The pragmatic obvious is completely missing. So that's where we're trying to position the UK fires activity is things that we can do now where businesses we know will grow because it's a certainty that these techno-optimistic opportunities uh, will be late and won't deliver at the scale that the government is hoping for them. So rather than uh, having only techno-optimism or enforced asceticism, let's plan for the businesses that will thrive when the techno-optimistic hopes fail. The kind of uh, way that's going to be brought about uh, we've talked about pricing carbon. That's been um, the main uh, weapon that economists have talked about. And for now, the carbon price is higher than it has been, and that's great. But of course, all the high emitters have negotiated exceptions. So it's not as effective a mechanism as you might want. And without a border adjustment, there's a very uh, great limit to how effective that can be if it simply puts out of businesses, puts out of business uh, operations that then will be replaced by imports. The thing that's actually worked so far is regulation. That's been the most powerful weapon so far. Um, but we've been working with the COP26 finance team under Mark Carney 
uh, on a new proposal based on what we've called ZERPAs, Zero Emissions Resource Procurement Agreements. And these are based on the idea that uh, you'll be able to convert corporate rhetoric to buying in advance access to non-emitting electricity, negative emissions or biomass, the only three substitutes that we can use for emissions. Um, and uh, if you could buy those and put them on the balance sheet to guarantee or to prove that you have secure access to them into the future, then your investors would be able to recognize that it wasn't just rhetoric, that your company actually had a plan uh, to get to zero emissions. So that will be launched in the summer, and I hope that that will start to uh, gain momentum and gain buy-in. The possibility of voluntary action is there. There's a very nice example of that with the two Swedish mothers who set up the flight shame campaign in Sweden. They persuaded a large number of people to pledge not to fly for a year. And in result for that, domestic takeoffs have fallen dramatically. And the Swedish government is now investing in domestic rail in a way that they wouldn't have done otherwise. So that's real and it's going to grow. But our focus in UK fires is on market leadership, spotting the areas that we know businesses are going to grow when the techno-optimistic hopes fail to deliver. If we can spot them now and position ourselves right, then we can be ready to take advantage of those markets as they inevitably grow. So that's the context for this talk. Absolute zero was therefore a pragmatic approach to anticipating what zero emissions means. Let's forget technologies that don't exist at scale yet. And if we look at the opportunities, if we want to replace currently emitting activities with like-for-like -like equivalents, Obviously, we could replace them either by not doing them or by substitutes using Zoom instead of travel and so on. But if we want like-for-like -like equivalents to currently emitting activities, all we can do is to substitute them with non-emitting electricity, biomass, or negative emissions technologies. And the point of these charts is to show how severe it is. There's the global supply of non-emitting electricity compared to our total energy demand. The net primary productivity is the net harvest of the world's plants. We're already, as a species, approaching 30% of all the world's harvest. And it's no wonder that every conservationist in the world is saying we cannot expand that. We have to reduce our appropriation of biomass. Or equivalently, if we're going to use biomass as part of our carbon mitigation strategy, we can only do it by substituting existing human uses not by expanding human use. And you can see that negative emissions so far haven't even left the axis. So that means that the pragmatic approach is to say we should assume that all energy is non-emitting uh, electricity, that we won't have as much as we'd like, we can't have extra biomass, and there'll be no negative emissions technologies. So that was the basis for absolute zero. Um, and you can see here that we took a graph of the non-emitting electricity supply in the UK. Over the last 10 years, it's expanded roughly in a linear manner. Uh, so as engineers, we projected that forwards and said that's a reasonable forecast for 2050. So far, we're pretty confident. Uh, by 2030, we know there'll be one nuclear power station operating in the UK. And the Prime Minister has committed to quadrupling offshore wind the contracts for doing that haven't yet lived up to the hope. But if they do, that won't quite get up to the linear prediction that we've made here. So it looks to me like it's about right, that that's a sensible uh, forecast. If we electrify everything we do today, then we'll have about 60% of the energy we need. But there are four things that we won't be able to continue. Two of them have emissions that we can't substitute, and that's ruminants, sheep and cows, and cement. And two of them, the alternative, which is essentially hydrogen or other synthetic fuels, requires so much electricity for flying and shipping that we're going to have to cut our use of that radically uh, because we won't have enough electricity there. What we can say, though, is which products are going to grow. If I look down the major categories here of emitting products that we purchase in the UK, cars, planes, buses and so on, then we know from this analysis that we're going to be buying the electrified equivalent of those, and we're going to want to find ways to reduce electricity demand. So we know already that all cars are going to be electric, but we aren't going to have as much electricity as we want. So either we have fewer cars or we have lighter cars. 
at the moment cars weigh 12, 12 and a half times more than the people inside them, which is completely nuts. But nobody's talking about that because of the dream that magic energy technologies will take the problem away. We need to wake up to that because obviously at some point we will. And the companies that are ready with lightweight, low energy electric cars are going to thrive at that moment. Um, and I've gone through all the options here. And I think I probably won't read them all out, but you probably know already the electric equivalents of all the things that we already have. And the need to reduce electricity demand is kind of obvious once you start thinking about it. One of the things we're doing within UK fires is trying to uh, get a much sharper picture of the material footprint of the UK. And we're doing that by mapping the uh, production and trade of materials using the PRODCOM database in great detail to develop a physical view of the materials flow into, through and out of the UK. So here's an early output of that to give a summary of the material activity that supports the UK at the moment. And you can see obviously that um, in every case here, the gray bar uh, is imports there. The gray bar to the right of the line is exports. You can see that we are importing most of our metal ores, for example, that's obvious about half of our wood, most of our oil and coal and so on. Um, here are the materials that we're making, um, familiar, and here are the main sectors that they've been using, and here is what they're being used for. I can only show a summary of this, but fairly soon we'll be releasing a clickable version of this where you can then drill into each of these categories to learn more about the material composition of each of those flows. But I thought this was useful for giving structure to what I want to say in the talk, because as we now apply the constraints of absolute zero to this map, what we need to look at is to think about materials production, what are we going to be able to access, how are we going to use it in manufacturing, and then what are we going to do with it at the end of life? How are we going to manage products? And then how are we going to uh, keep products going and manage the uh, delivery of end of life materials? So that's the structure I want to work my way through now. Let's start with materials production. The obvious um, transformation that's going to occur in materials production is to move from fossil powered heat, high temperature heat to electric. Um, and the main ch challenge of that is not the heat itself, but the transfer. We can obviously, um, electricity has infinite exergy, so you can get any temperature you like from it. It doesn't have a limiting flame temperature. And we have the various mechanisms to convert electricity to heat. But the challenge is the transfer mechanism. And that seems to us to be a huge area for growth. Um, we know, for example, that there are many ways that we use gas flames at the moment, either in furnaces or for localized heat. Um, and uh, all of those are going to have to be replaced by electric heat um, in the future. And we don't think that all of these um, transfer mechanisms have been exploited. So, for example, to heat a stream of ceramics, it's very difficult to do that with electric heating. Uh, using air as a transfer mechanism is rather inefficient. But if you could place your um, ceramics temporarily in a conductive liquid, um, then you would find a different way of creating transfer, and that would create a much more effective form of electric heating. It seems to us this is wide open. In preheating electric uh, industrial equipment at the moment, for example, in uh, an electric arc furnace, the, the crucible is preheated with a gas flame. Well, it clearly could be heated by resistive uh, heating, uh, by inductive heating, or we could put some other medium in it uh, in order to transfer electrical heat into the body and then empty it out again before we put in the scrap ready for the process to run. We know that that business is going to grow. If I think about that within the different materials production, at this stage, just thinking about the heat of it, uh, then for high temperature processes, then the electrically conductive fluids, so molten metals, are the ones where this is relatively easy. Um, the very difficult one is to generate enough heat in a cement furnace because of the difficulty of creating transfer. Um, and then for intermediate metals processing in the solid state, uh, we know there are options there. Inductive heating has proved to be relatively difficult to control, um, but that's something where innovation can help. 
um, and in producing high value chemicals, ceramics, glass, we've got to think of other transfer mechanisms because these are non-conductive. So maybe that's about finding intelligent designs of fin uh, for metal to fluid transfer or uh, using advanced mesh design. Uh, there could be all sorts of opportunities there for new products, for new business growth. For the lower temperatures, we think it's rather easy. Um, and in particular for wood and paper production, when the temperatures are much lower, then really it's quite easy to get to an all electric uh, route of production there. However, that's only the heat. We also need to think about the process emissions. And that's where life becomes really challenging for the materials supply of the future. Um, cement, as you know, about half the emissions of today are from heat. And the industry has been acting on that, for example, by uh, changing to waste combustion rather than uh, and reducing its um, fossil fuel combustion. And of course, they've also been substituting in granulated blast furnace slag and fly ash. But unfortunately, both of those products are going to disappear as we approach the zero emissions world. Cement is difficult, and I'll have a slide to look at the alternatives next. But essentially, we've got no options for that. Blast furnace steel, we can't separate what's heat and what's process emissions. Um, but we can't reduce iron ore without um, the combination of carbon monoxide with uh, oxygen. Uh, to, to take the oxygen out of the ore, um, unless we move to those hydrogen-based routes um, where we've already talked about the difficulty of finding enough hydrogen. Aluminium production consumes the graphite anodes, and we've failed yet to bring inert anodes on stream, despite years of talking about it. Um, plastics is currently linked to uh, oil production, so at the moment the processes are inseparable. Um, once oil production ceases, as it must, then we then have an opportunity for new routes to plastic production and electric production of plastics uh, would lead to the release of methane. But if we could then find alternative electric uses for the methane in the chemicals industry, potentially there is an all electric route there. Glass has process emissions, um, as do ceramics. So it's a fairly tough picture, this really at the moment, only textiles and paper look as if they don't have process emissions, although both of those do depend on the use of chemicals that we currently don't know how to make. So the whole mater primary materials supply system is vulnerable to the strict requirement of zero emissions, but we need to look that in the eye and respond to it rather than hoping that magic beans are going to take it away. As we stand, there is no basis for betting on negative emissions technologies to hide the difficulty of the problem I'm presenting here. Let's just look at cement um, a little bit. Uh, cement has a lot of champions for all sorts of different options, but unfortunately there aren't any magic cements to take it away. This is a survey of all the different cements we know about. And you can see we've used five parameters of the CO2 emissions, the scale of availability, the strength of the material, its durability and its early age strength. So there are many champions, for example, for lime mortar, which has lower emissions. It is available at scale, but its strength is terrible compared to Portland cement. Um, geopolymers uh, have very low emissions, uh, but they're only available at very small scale, even though they could have reasonable strength and they're a bit low in durability. Uh, blast furnace slag, as I've said, because we're going to shut the blast furnaces, then we aren't going to have much scale available of that at all although it's attractive on CO2 emissions. Um, so although there are many alternatives that have less emissions, there are none who have zero. And again, just to go back to the CCS plant, uh, problem, um, cement is capital intensive. Refitting plants is about as expensive as building new ones. Um, CCS plants are have got to be new. There isn't a plug-in. You can't kind of add a magic hoover to the exit of an existing CCS plant. Um, and currently, there's only one pilot scale plant um, proposed, and we're not actually certain that's going to happen. So new cement is a major problem for us. And I think, therefore, the pragmatic approach to business growth is to plan for no cement and think about all the opportunities that creates, rather than assuming that somebody will take the problem away. The one we've done most work on is steel, and here's the map of steel use in the world. That's, I think, become quite well known. 
I want to think about steel at end of life now. So if we look at all of the products there, we spent a lot of time looking at how long all of these products last. And because steel is almost perfectly recycled, we know it's going to come back. So if I look at the average lifespan of products and look at the past history of when these products were made, then globally, we can make a pretty good forecast to say what's going to happen in the future. The top line here assumes that global demand for steel is unchanged by climate change. Obviously, that's a wrong assumption, but it's quite useful to look at the business as usual here. And the blue line shows the availability of scrap for recycling, which we know because it tracks the global production of steel 30 to 40 years earlier. So even if we ignore climate change, which we won't, but even if we do, we already have as many blast furnaces available in the world as we need now. But if we do uh, account for climate change, then you can see we're going to shut the blast furnaces and the supply will go down a bit. But the growth in scrap supply is a huge opportunity if we can turn that into really good steel. At the moment, steel recycling is down recycling. Could we make it good? So that's the question we've been looking at. But with a bit more detail, here are the sources of end-of-life scrap that enter the steel system at the moment. And um, one of the key uh, issues in that is, of course, where does that go? So we've mapped where the end-of-life scrap currently goes. And you can see that most of it ends up in reinforcing bar or rods used in the construction industry. And that's because of a quality problem. The way that the industry is configured at the moment, then most steel recycling is to a lower quality than primary steel because the market can absorb it in rebar and other uh, less visible products. Within cars, a relatively small fraction of the steel that ends up in cars comes from recycled sources. Uh, we spend quite a lot of time looking at that specifically for the UK. Uh, and if we look at the total picture of the UK steel industry, you can see UK demand for steel products on the right. The rather grim picture of our production on the left shows that most of the steel made in the UK is immediately exported at lowest value, which is grim reading. We then import crude steel, uh, which we then um, use in manufacturing. So most of our crude steel is exported for rolling and processing elsewhere. We import it for manufacturing, we import components, um, and then we import final steel containing goods. So sadly, almost the only steel products that are made in the UK from UK steel are those that are used in the construction industry. Uh, and of course, we export a lot of what we make, particularly uh, from the car industry. But if we looked differently at this, then the total demand for steel on the right-hand side here, the UK demand, is actually not that uh, dissimilar to the total supply that we're using. We're pretty close to being ready for a closed loop by volumes if we can manage the quality. So let's look at that quality problem. This is a fantastic picture um, created to look at the chemistry of steel recycling. And the question is, what happens to all the chemical elements in steel when you blow oxygen through it after recycling in order to try and purify it? And you can see that large amounts of the impurities in the steel get taken off to the slag. Um, a small amount, so silver and zinc, uh, go off into gas. And that's why there are scrubbers on the chimneys in order to try and contain that. And some of the elements stay in the metal. So the alloying elements, nickel, cobalt, uh, um, and so on, uh, are helpful. Those are useful to keep in the steel. But the problems are tin, copper, um, uh, tin and copper, which cause hot shortening, this cracking phenomenon where they accumulate at the surface and create a weakness that turns into cracks on the surface during processing. So tin is quite well controlled um, because the uh, supply of tin in scrap is linked to food packaging and that can be separated and detinned. And there's a detinning plant in the UK that does that very effectively. So it comes down to copper being the main problem in the quality of steel recycling. So here is a map of the location of copper in that uh, map of the world's steel. Where does it come from and where does it go? As we said before, most recycled steel goes into rebar and rods used in construction. And that's because of its copper content. We can tolerate a high copper content in rebar. 
But most of the copper arrives in the electric motors of vehicles and other goods because of the shredding process used in recycling. And if we project this forwards, then it looks like we have a problem. And the reason is that the copper that gets into the recycled metal then stays there. So when that rebar comes back for recycling in future, we still have the high copper concentration. So by about 2040, we're going to get to the point that the world can't recycle all the steel it has available because the copper concentration has become too high. Um, so that says, what can we do to reduce the copper contamination or control copper in the steel um, system? And here are six areas, every one of which is a business growth opportunity, whether it's in disassembly, new approaches to shredding or sorting, new approaches to controlling copper in the melt, copper tolerant casting, uh, ArcelorMittal are looking at belt casting of high copper um, steel in order to try and control the uh, the hot cracking problem, uh, or indeed reducing the copper content in new cars. We've talked to one car manufacturer who are looking at aluminium motors in order to make the recycling route work better. And we've done a mapping of all of those um, metallurgical processes to look at the fact that there are many processes which would allow us to take the copper concentration down from what rebar can tolerate to what can be tolerated by car body steel they're operating in Rotherham, Rotherham, for example, vacuum arc remelting uh, to produce very expensive steel, but for the aerospace grades, some of the most high, highly demanding grades. So the innovation opportunity is to take those expensive processes and to simplify them and to get them into high volume. So there is a big opportunity here. Um, and if we look at material sourcing overall, we can see that the, the opportunity is about upcycling. That's the big uh, growth area in UK future materials supply. Cement and ceramics, we've got no options for new production. Plastics, there's space for new electric routes. Uh, we think textiles and paper are okay. Um, metals is all about upcycling rather than downcycling. Uh, wood, probably okay. Paper, we've got to be careful about the chemicals used in pulping. Chemicals like plastics, it's all about converting to electric production and so on. So the story is that there can be material supply. It cannot be at the volume that we've had it in the past or have now, but there's a huge business growth opportunity here for the people who get involved in upcycling rather than downcycling our old materials. Let's move on and think about manufacturing. The obvious outcome of what I've said is that material sourcing is not going to match today's supply. So that says that manufacturing is about three things, avoiding over-design and waste, smaller, lighter products, and long, longer life products. So let's have a quick look at those. Um, we've had a big project running in the construction industry for the last five years, where we discovered um, about eight years ago that on average the new build uh, office buildings in the UK had more than double the amount of materials in them required by the euro codes that define our safety standards and the reason for that is firstly that it's cheaper to build uh, with more material and less labor than with more labor and less material because material prices are so low but as we kept looking at it we discovered there was also a design issue if you think of um, an uh, a office block um, being reduced to this rather simple picture, which I like as my background is in manufacturing, so I like to put the civil engineers in their place, then there's vertical elements, horizontal elements, and foundations. And most of the material is in the horizontal elements. For the last 10 years, architects have persuaded clients that the key to the value of their building is to have the columns as far apart as possible to create flexibility in the building. But if you think about that as an engineer, what that means is that the horizontal structure has to get disproportionately thicker because the tendency to bend is greatest in the middle of the horizontal structure. And that grows, non, the total mass required grows uh, non-linearly with the increased spacing of the beams. So as I scale it up in thinking about my total material choice in the building, the beam spacing matters. And when we looked into that more, it turns out that the design options here are very, there's a huge range of choices of not just the spacing, 
but also the form of decking, the form of the vertical, the type of foundation and so on. So with two, three now Innovate UK projects, we've been developing software that automates the evaluation of all possible options in building design, looking at the carbon and the cost of all existing options before the client signs off on the first contract about the scheme of the project. So before the client gets bamboozled into ex expecting wide column spacing, we want to allow them to discuss with the uh, structural engineers and with the architect the options they have. And you can see what a vast range of outcomes you can have here. And the fact that the efficient frontier shows quite a good correlation between carbon and cost. And this is including all of the labor cost. So about a month ago, we launched the Panda software. Panda is an acronym that I can't remember, but um, somebody in the process has come up with this um, nice logo. And I think you can Google Panda and find it. And Panda is there to start um, commercializing, it, or we've commercialized it to make money out of it. But it's there for the industry to start uh, taking better decisions at the very first sta stage of the scheme. And you can see both that that's an example of a new business opportunity that we've captured. But the service that we're able to offer is then one that's going to add value in the construction supply chain. So I use that as an example of where we think there is a growth for resource efficiency business services. Here's a completely different study that we looked at in the car industry. Um, if you uh, talk to the senior managers of the car industry, I found it's quite stimulating to point out to them that they primarily make scrap and the car is a byproduct. Uh, on average, the car industry throws away about half of all the sheet metal it buys. And the reason is that it buys coils of sheet that are is a constant width in order to make car body panels, which are anything but a constant width. And um, you can see that part of the loss is due to the blank, not tessellating, that's the blue area. You can see that the sides of my picture here are fixed, so that's the width of the coil, the coils moving up and down the screen. But all the orange material is required for deep drawing. Uh, you need to grip the material in order to shape the body panels without wrinkling and tearing. And that then gets cut off after shaping. And when we looked at the material use in the car industry, then it turns out that it's trimming after stamping is the major loss. So we've been working on that one for five years to invent a new process in this case to say, could we do deep drawing without going through the stage of needing material gripped in a blank holder? Um, and here is the process idea that we now hold the patent on. And again, we're trying to commercialize. Deep drawing grips the edge of the blank and then has the punch move through and allows the material to slide through the blank holder. What we're exploring instead is firstly to fold down the sides of the product where there are any flat or shallow curvature sides. Um, and that's the first stage. And that then creates a bulge of material at the corner. And we've been looking at the design of dies that can then um, shear the corner material into the final shape. Um, shearing is important because that keeps the thickness of the material constant. And it's also the most efficient. The for tool forces are lowest in that case. And we just got our first product um, out of this about two or three weeks ago. And you can see we've obviously got a long way to go. This is just a representation of the corner of a five-sided box. But the real product is showing good quality um, we've got a better thickness distribution in deep drawing. And if we're right, then potentially this is uh, a new way of replacing deep drawing with much lower trimming loss. You can see that rather like the way that cans are made at the moment, there's no trim loss on the sides of the product here. Well, that's very early stages, and I'm not banking on our process being the only one that solves the world's waste of scrap uh, sheet metal. But it's an example to show where there's an innovation opportunity sitting there once we embrace the reality rather than pretending that magic energy technologies will take it away. Smaller, lighter products. I love this picture of the two minis. This is the one made by Alec Isigonis. This is the one made by the Germans once they'd taken over our nice uh, British car. Uh, there's no Photoshop, but they've doubled the size of it. Uh, they claim they've done that because that's what customers want. Uh, as a 
slight sub motivation. It's cheaper to make uh, or, or customers pay a lot more for a larger car than a small one, but the cost of making it isn't that different because the number of components is the same. And as a result, on average, the cars in the UK now weigh 1.4 tonnes per car. The two litre, uh, the, the um, X1 car developed by Volkswagen uh, was approaching 200 miles per gallon simply by getting the weight down. This version weighed 200 kilograms. They eventually tried selling one that was heavier than that. Uh, but we know that smaller cars are going to be the future because we won't have enough electricity to power ugly monsters like BMW make out of our previously beautiful Mini. Every single country in the world, apart from America, the average weight of cars being sold has gone up over the last two decades. And the only reason that the American average weight has come down is that they were double at the beginning. And yet the graph here on fuel consumption um, related to vehicle weight is absolutely clear. We want smaller, lighter cars to reduce the amount of energy required. And finally, talking about long life, here's back to that picture in uh, steel. Um, again, the, uh, if you look at all those products, when we looked at what happened at end of life, it turned out that it's only the infrastructure, only bridges and tunnels um, that are broken, that have actually reached the end of their physical life when they're replaced. Uh, the reason that these products are replaced is because they've reached the end of their economic life because a new innovation or some feature is now more attractive in a new product than the old one. And that's a great pointer to where we're going. We can't afford to do that. So renewing the economic life of products without replacing all of their materials is actually the core future of manufacturing. And in a sense, that links to what I want to say about end of life, the last uh, theme of the talk. I'll have to accelerate a little bit here. Um, I'll, I'll move over those talks about circular car. But I think when we look at that question about end of life, it looks to us as if the future of manufacturing is primarily about repair and upgrade and not primarily about developing new products. We've started a project doing a kind of Ashby map of the processes, the problems that uh, occur, why things fail physically, where cracks occur or buildups of unwanted deposits occur, and of all the processes that could be used to develop them. And we think there is a huge growth there in trying to find economies of scale in the repair of components, where today repair actually tends to mean replacing a component with a brand new equivalent. Um, and uh, I'm on the steering committee of a very nice project with Rolls, looking at on-wing maintenance, where they're just beginning to think about using the techniques of advanced manufacturing in situ to avoid the high cost of taking the engine off the wing. Now, of course, I'm not that interested in that project because we won't be selling aircraft engines in the future. We know that they're a redundant product. Uh, but the technique of bringing these technologies uh, in for insight repair is just a hint of how manufacturing could reinvent itself. And indeed, I think Rolls-Royce could reinvent itself as a repairer of high value products. Uh, and that's a very exciting future. So the key to um, future, I think, of manufacturing and products in use is finding the economies of scale in repair. There's a lot of opportunities. There's trade-offs between standardization and repair. We know that. There's a lot of learning we could do from service industries. We know about opportunities for diagnostics, new businesses, and so on. Um, and I haven't got time now to talk about this, but we did a project on uh, the Land Rover Defender, 80% of which are still in use. And when we went and talked to owners of Defenders, they all said, oh, I haven't done much to my Defender. I've just made the chassis a bit longer. I've added a couple of seats and I put a new engine in, but I haven't done much. And there's something about that product which is so open that it invites people to engage with it and it becomes a project. They like touching it and modifying it. It's something which people feel able to touch. And maybe there's a hint there of a future for product design that people can be part of and that builds up stories. That dent in the wing when Uncle Jim went to the tree on the picnic becomes something we want rather than something to hide. And products that engage people in a different way must be a growth when the material supply is constrained. So the last slide, using our material map, we've made a first attempt and we're working hard on this 
to try and compare what materials we're likely to have if all we've got is material recycling with what we use at the moment. And obviously we're digging into this in detail to try and map the details of the supply against the details of the product to work out how exactly each of these sectors is going to have to change. But we can bet on these six innovation opportunities as key areas which are going to grow whatever happens about climate change, even if some of the magic beans develop faster than we think, we know these businesses will grow. The electrification of materials production, eliminating process emissions, high productivity material recovery and upcycling, business services for resource efficiency, in my infinite life products with through life manufacturing, and products compatible with zero emissions where we started from. We know that those are going to grow, and that seems to me to be a very bright future for UK manufacturing, in contrast, perhaps, to how you might have reacted to the opening statement of absolute zero of saying we're going to be short of energy. We are going to be short of energy, but hallelujah, look at all these opportunities that's going to create for us. Thanks very much. Julian, thank you. Excellent, um, riveting presentation and, and uh, outputs. Uh, yeah, so a couple of questions for you to get things moving. Um, the, the first one is actually, well, HV, well, the Catapult Network's done some work looking at embodied emissions in manufacturing. And, and the early analysis suggests that between, depending on the sector, between 60 and 85% of manufacturing emissions are embedded at the materials extraction and prime materials processing step, as opposed to downstream manufacturing. Do you think that uh, the manufacturing sector and government as a whole is looking in the right place to fix the problem currently? Yeah, our, our numbers would confirm exactly what you've just said, uh, Sam. Um, and we're doing a lot to try and raise awareness. Um, I've just, uh, at the front of the book we wrote in 2012, we created a picture of our material family representing the materials that we all use as human sculptures. Um, and Coventry, in their year of City of Culture, have commissioned those sculptures to be made. So sometime in the next year, that will appear on the streets of Coventry uh, and we'll get a lot of uh, media publicity around it, just to try and help everybody wake up to the fact that it's the materials, not the manufacturing, that matter. I'm not quite sure how that, that's going in government, but it does point to where all the changes got to occur um, on the way. Within manufacturing, I think most of the emissions are furnaces. It's about heating things within the manufacturing system. So there is an opportunity there, but it's the material sourcing that matters. Thank you. And, and the innovation opportunity presented in the summary stages there, if we pick on a couple of those, where do you think the balance of effort and opportunity lies between life extension and repair versus um, material recovery? Yeah, there's a good choice. And I don't know the answer. It seems to me like we've got to go like crazy for both of them. Um, the steel one is a sitting duck. And I've been lobbying the government for five years now about the fact that we know that Port Talbot is going to close. That's a sad truth. But it, at the least, we know it's illegal in 2050, uh, in 29 years time. But there's global overcapacity for blast furnaces. Uh, and it's going to be very, very difficult to sustain that into the long term. But because we've got, we're exporting 90% of our scrap at the moment, we're in a brilliant position to be the world leader in upcycling steel. Um, it takes some investment, but the next time the steel company goes bust, we could be going for that one like mad. So I think that's almost one activity, but the people involved in that are a completely different group to the group who could be looking at uh, infinite life products and, and repair. Yeah. So I feel that both of them should be going like crazy in those areas. But taking the recycled steel example, what do you think needs to happen from a, a corporate government finance perspective to realize that opportunity for the UK? Because it's quite an exciting proposition. Yeah. I think the evidence from uh, the the slow pace of change and, of course, the rather sad story about liberty that the Financial Times is making so much of at the moment is that financing the change is difficult. Um, but the government has put a lot of money into holding blast furnaces open while waiting for them to be sold to foreign owners. 
And if we'd instead use that money to invest in the transformation to a recycling-based uh, industry, particularly at Scunthorpe, that was such a missed opportunity because it's next to the North Sea and it was making long products, which is slightly less demanding than the Port Talbot products. So that was a moment when it should either have been nationalized or the government should have invested rather than to support jobs in the short term for sale as is, they could have invested in the transformation. I think it's going to have to have government investment to make uh, the, the dif difference. I mean, it does feel like there's a market failure there, doesn't it? I mean, what, what confidence do you have that we can create the market conditions to incentivise uh, low emissions manufacturing and, and some of the opportunities you've presented? I don't think it's going to come from global carbon pricing because we don't have a global uh, police force. And the steel industry absolutely exemplifies the problem that unless we have border tax adjustments, uh, then we aren't going to be able to do this with market forces. It will in due course come about by regulation. Um, whether the government is brave enough to regulate on it, I doubt. So I fear it's going to be too late before we act, unless we can persuade the government that it's about strategy rather than kind of damage limitation, which is how they tend to think at the moment. Yeah, so a um, related point to that then, how, how do we motivate government to seize this opportunity, the opportunity you presented, the growth opportunities, rather than continue on a decades-old path of solving the problem by offshoring our manufacturing emissions and supply yeah. base. I think that's absolutely urgent, isn't it? We are um, currently working on an update to the Absolute Zero report called Minus 45, based on the target that you mentioned at the beginning. In December, the government announced that we would cut our emissions by 2030 um, to a level equivalent to a 45% cut from today. And the way we're framing that report is to say, well, the commitment is absolute. So that means that by default, the government is committing us to 45% austerity, unless they take policy actions to reduce the austerity. So in the steel industry's case, the government is saying, we commit you to a 45% closure, unless uh, we take actions to support you. And I'm hoping that that might gain some political traction uh, because it's, it's absolutely clear in the material supply sector that the default position is just to shut it and pretend it's not happening when it happens in another country. And that is crazy where the, the strategic position is to support the transformation in the UK so we don't just become yet more dependent on imports. I couldn't agree more, Julian. And, and the, the UK's 1.1% of global emissions the chance to show leadership, I suppose, in addressing the global problem, because it clearly is a global problem, mm. not to offshore our own problems, but to start solving them first at home and then, then globally, surely. I think that's right from a moral framing, but from the future of, the manuf of manufacturing in the UK, if the harder we embrace these constraints, the better we are in being first in to what we know is going to be the future of manufacturing. Um, so I think that what we're talking about today uh, it sounds radical, but it isn't. It's foresight of what is inevitably going to be manufacturing of the future. And if we embrace it, then we can be ready to go. So you're talking about an alignment of the moral and the business growth incentives here. Exactly. Right? It, exactly that. Excellent. Well, thank you, Julian. We're, we're coming to, to a close. I remind everybody that... Um, that the recording will be available and circulated offline. And any questions you've not been able to answer, maybe through the Yamaki team, we'll see if we can come back to you on some of those uh, offline. As a final question, what can individual listeners do, both as individuals and through their companies, do you think, as takeaways to start realising these opportunities and addressing the challenges? Yeah, thanks, Sam. I think the six opportunities I put at the end, we've tried to write in a way that is quite broad. Some of them are services, some of them are technologies. And I would think almost everybody involved in manufacturing could look at at least one of those and think, yeah, actually there is a chance for us here. Um, what we've been doing in the research group is trying to pick out the hardest ones where it looks like there's no hope. Uh, and then actually that's what engineers are really good at, isn't it? If you pose them a problem and say, you'll never be able to solve this, that's the moment that engineering creativity fights back. So actually embracing the reality of zero emissions, I think 
is the starting point for the creative journey to finding the new way. Excellent. Well, thank you, Julian. Outstanding presentation and talk and hopefully lots for the listeners to think about and act upon. And thank you all for listening to us today. Bye. Thanks.